Um, tonight is a special guest. Brother Rob has been with us for, I don't know, a long time, Brother Rob, huh? He's been a source of mentor, especially for me. I always try to uh, pick at his brain. So for you, for, for everyone here, it's a special time. We're going to hear his testimony. And not only that, if you have any questions regarding rural properties, that's his specialty. Okay. So again, Brother Rob, take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope we don't have a lot of testing of our faith tonight with technical difficulties, but things should be better for me because I've lived in the country for a long time and I'm so far out that we don't have all the amenities out here like people have in the city. And I know a lot of us take like really fast internet and things like that for granted, which we don't have out here um, until this week when I was able to finally receive my Starlink equipment. And I went from about one and a half to two megabytes uh, a second out to probably almost 150, which is absolutely insane for us because we're so used to seeing the buffering and not being able to use um, things like Zoom here. Uh, but it's pretty cool. We'll, we'll get used to it probably too fast. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of background uh, as we get started. Um, I know from the brochure that Sister Sharon sent out, um, it's kind of a kind of a contrast in the two things that I, from where I was to where I became. Um, you know, I grew up in a family that was somewhat in the Adventist faith. Um, my parents had come into the Adventist faith. My mother had been a Roman Catholic and Catholicism influenced her uh, understanding of Adventism uh, for the majority of her life until just the last few years when she began to really, really finally understand our message um, and be freed from some of the works oriented things that she was stuck with. Uh, my father had been uh, a child in a, in a mixed home his uh, father had been a Mormon. Uh, his mother had been an Adventist. Both of them were backslidden. Uh, father was excommunicated from the, Ad or from the Mormon uh, church. And so my grandfather and grandmother were basically nothing. And of course, my, my dad was raised in a pretty much a nothing environment until he was a teenager when his father died unexpectedly and um, family moved uh, out of the city out into the country and um, boy that's a story in itself someday i might share that with you but my mom wanted all of us kids to be christened into the roman catholic church and my father was absolutely unwilling for that to happen and he just put his feet down and he said, no, not going to happen. And my mom did not know why. And she was pretty upset about it. And he said, I don't know, other than they probably will turn into little beasts or something. Um, because he was so ignorant. So they took her Catholic Bible and they read it from cover to cover together. Uh, rather than, you know, go their separate ways. Probably people would do that today. But back then it was pretty unheard of. And they read it when they got done to the end they decided that they would be Seventh-day Adventists because they needed to worship Jesus and do that on the Seventh-day Sabbath. And so they were able to become Seventh-day Adventists, but they had a lot of learning to do because people already assumed that because um, they uh, were wanting to be Seventh-day Adventists that they must know everything about it. And I mean, they, they had so much to learn they were baptized at a church on one side of Minneapolis and the, the pastor said, well, why don't you, why didn't you get baptized at the uh, church over there in, in St. Paul where, uh, 
where you live. And they said, okay. So they sent their membership over there. Everyone now assumed that they were transferring memberships, that they were, you know, Adventists and good standing for a long time. And I remember they were talking about Sister White and my mother was overjoyed and she said, oh, you have nuns. I didn't know that the Adventist church had nuns and everybody looked at her shocked and said, what are you talking about nuns? And they said, well, you keep talking about Sister White. And, she, and uh, they said, no, 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 don't you know anything? Where did you come from? You know, what do you know what you don't know? And so one of the ladies gave my mom a couple of spirit prophecy books and one of them was Adventist Home. And so she began to start reading it and it wasn't very long. She told my dad, she said, we have to move to the country. We cannot live in the city if we're going to be Seventh-day Adventists. Um, so they did. They moved to, the, moved to the country. And so I was, you know, raised in the country. And I went to some church schools. I actually did a little bit of a time in an Adventist academy. But as I hit my late teens, because my, my parents weren't very well founded in the faith, uh, I really didn't know much about being a Seventh-day Adventist, and I left uh, the faith in my late teens, and I did not return to Adventism until I was in my mid-30s, and during that time, I was um, in the world. I didn't have a thought to think about as far as being a, a Christian. I didn't, I didn't practice Christianity. And of course, when you don't have, uh, you know, when you're not in the fire, the coal just kind of gets cold and goes dead on its own. And that's really what happened to me. Um, my experience with Christians, um, theologians, pastors, various people, uh, wasn't a good one. I noticed that they, there were a lot of inconsistencies in what people taught. Uh, one pastor had one theory, another pastor had another. Theologians had all these various theories. Um, I actually did attend um, two Adventist universities, and um, I would ask them, you know, what's, what's with all of this chaos in, in our belief system? And I got such conflicting information that it really discouraged me um, to the point that um, I just stopped believing in God, period, and didn't waste any more of my time in confusion. So out on my own in the world, um, I would encounter Christians from time to time, pastors, lay people, and I would ask them, you know, when they get all fired up, I said, can you prove to me there is a God? And the response I always got was, no, you cannot prove there's God. Um, you have to accept that in faith. You know, that, that's, that's the basic tenet of Christianity is faith. We, we accept Jesus and the God and their existence on faith. And I said, well, I have no faith. So, you know, enjoy what you have over there. But I, I don't have no, any faith. I have no basis for faith. I don't even, you know, I don't believe in the things that you believe in. And... I think maybe I was 99% atheist and 1% Christian because I, I kind of wanted to hedge my bet. I was a little afraid of the idea that maybe um, <clears throat> I might get this very unpleasant surprise sometime in the future when I, then I discovered there was a God. And he and I weren't friends and uh, he might just destroy me. And I, I didn't like that idea, but I, I really didn't see any reason to actually accept his existence. But then um, one day I discovered in a box of old books that my parents had uh, left in a house that I purchased from them. And I found this book called Prophecy Speaks. And it was by an author by the name of uh, Earl Albert Rowell. And it was about a gentleman who had been an atheist and had converted to Christianity. And I was pretty intrigued with the topic bothered me because prophecy is of course boring. Uh, at least that's what I thought. And uh, I really didn't want to get deep into prophecy and, you know, the, the big creatures and the, the visions and whatever, but I can't resist a good story. I'm, I'm a avid reader and I'm a, I guess you would say I'm a book freak. 
And so I'm almost unwillingly and unwittingly beginning to read this book. And I realize it's a book about a, a man who uh, had converted back to Christianity or to convert Christianity from atheism. Put up uh, billboards, ads in newspaper, whatever, and he'd rent a big um, public uh, venue. And he would challenge atheists to come to his meetings. Anybody who had a doubt, come on and bring your questions, bring your accusations, whatever. Um, and uh, he would he would entertain their questions, and he would say, "Okay, you know, the first half here, I'm going to tell you some things, and then you you have every uh, opportunity to question me on these things." And as I read the story, I began to follow that he was using a comparison between Bible prophecy and secular history, because skeptics will tell you that, well, yes, the Bible has prophecies, but for those that appear to have come true, um, it's quite apparent that these prophecies were written after the event actually happened. So it's really easy when you've got those backward looking glasses to write a false prophecy and make it seem very credible. But using history, secular history, that seemed you know, pretty incontrovertible, here we have this proof that there was an intelligence that gave the message prior to the event and not the other way around, like the skeptics would say. And he did that over and over and over through the book. And, you know, I'd go look at the prophecies and I'd read them. And here's the historical references from secular history that people have no doubts in. They believe it. Um, as I reached the end of the book, I felt this huge, relief because i now knew there was a god and <clears throat> whereas before you know i didn't really believe in him and i knew that there was a god and that at this point the people who represented him were just confused and ignorant but if there is a god and there is a bible then there certainly must be some way that i can find what truth is and i began to study it I had this big weight roll off of my shoulders, whereas before uh, I was looking at a future into the into the distant future that was just totally unknown. And now I've got the Bible and with the Bible that I now believe versus the Bible I did not believe in the past. Uh, I set out on a journey to discover what was truth and, and where I could go with my life and um, how I might enter into a relationship with God versus just laughing at his existence and then being terrified at his existence to the point that I actually could actually find myself comfortable in his existence and in his presence. And that was amazing to me. <clears throat> and I was really excited to share that with people. Well, it didn't take long before uh, people began to take notice that I was different than I had been before. And I attracted both genuine Christians, but unfortunately, a lot of fanatics. Um, it seemed like the fanatics came out of the woodwork just in a crazy rate. And they began to attach themselves to myself and my wife. And uh, they all would want us to begin to follow their particular flavor of fanaticism. And <clears throat> we next, you know, Pretty soon we discovered that we were following all these fanatical things. And uh, we had kind of strayed away from the everlasting gospel and the truth and what our message is and the message that we should be sharing with the world. And one thing I'll tell you about Adventist fanatics, they, they don't tend to go out and reach the world. They just become incestuous and they turn towards other Adventists to confuse. Because misery loves company and people just don't want to be into whatever it is that they're in on their own because they tend to lose confidence in their fanaticism. And so they have to have other people to fan the flames and keep them warm in their fanatical beliefs. And so all these people begin to try to recruit us. And I, I, I don't want to tell you what I was into because I'm probably going to offend some fanatics. Um, so I will just tell you that 
we have a wonderful and beautiful message and we don't need to walk off the path and get caught up in things. Uh, I will just tell you that you can take health reform and turn it into a deform if you don't stay balanced and keep Jesus very special in your life. Um, I've had people who have taken in my life, people in my life who took dress reform to a deform and become fanatical with it. Um, so many fanatical things, so many, so many, as, a, as an old farm kid, uh, if you get sent out to bring the cows home, you uh, are told to take the farm dog and go out and get the cows and they need to be in the barn by a certain amount of time. And, uh, so off you go. Well, what do farm kids, farm boys, and farm dogs find along the way? Jackrabbits. And so a farm dog begins to chase the jackrabbits, so does the farm boy. And you end up spending all your time chasing jackrabbits and you never get, never get the cows back home. And that's what I'm seeing so many of my Adventist brothers and sisters doing today. They're chasing jackrabbits and they're not on the, they're not on the path. And we're going to hit a really bad bad event, <clears throat> bad outcome with that. So friends, I just want to tell you, stick with our original message. Don't get into fanatical ideas. Um, and um, if, you, if you want, I can tell you some of those particular someday, but at the risk of offending people, I'm going to not get specific. But what I will tell you is that um, as soon as I had finally gotten God back into my life again and he became a real person to me um i began to run into a lot of the uh, challenges uh, in my life where habits and things in my life came into a confrontation course with uh, with the spirit and uh, when i found the lord i was a pretty hardcore alcoholic and so now here i have alcoholism in my life. And so, you know, people say, well, you found Jesus, why didn't you just quit? Well, I did. I quit like seven days a week. Um, but it was, uh, it was a battle that had to be won. And I really didn't understand how to win it. And I didn't know, I didn't know how you fought spiritual battles like that. You know, alcohol, alcoholism counselor once told me that you'll be an alcoholic for the rest of your life. Um, you might dry out, you might be a dry drunk, but you'll always be drunk. You know, that didn't sound very exciting to me because I really wanted to be released from it completely. I didn't want to have to battle with it for the rest of my life. And uh, somewhere along in the mix of things, some people came by and they uh, began to read some things to us out of the spirit of prophecy. Well, when I was a child, I hated Ellen White because she just was this thing that I got beat over the head with every time I wanted to do anything that was fun. And if I wanted to do anything fun or interesting, some gray bearded person would show up with a little red book and beat me over the head. With it. And so I really resented her and hated her. And, but now I'm an adult and now I really truly want a relationship with the Lord. And people began to read things to me. And so I began to read some of her writings and I began to read, um, Desire of Ages. And I tell you what, anytime you get, lost in your spiritual walk you get disconnected get your eyes off the lord go get desire of ageism it really will bring you back around again and get you focused <clears throat> i also begin to read um oh testimonies to ministers testimonies to the church and i began and it was one of the most precious books that i ever read was early writings that oh i tell you what early writings was what really really got my feet on the ground and really connected me with the Lord and really helped me understand what our message is. And after reading some of that, I realized that I didn't hate her anymore and that she had been misrepresented to me and that I don't ever want to beat somebody with Ellen White or the Bible or any of the Old Testament prophets. Um, we've got to find a way to make Jesus attractive instead of distasteful. So I began to uh, make a lot of changes in my life and Satan really was angry. He attacked me in so many ways 
And, you know, when you're first coming in your faith and you're first, first learning how to walk, you stumble and fall. And I had a stumble and a fall. And so Satan woke me up about three o'clock in the morning. And I'm sitting there pondering the mistake that I had made, wondering about how to untangle the mess I was in. <clears throat> and this voice spoke to me um, in my mind very, very loudly. And it said, you sinned and I am done with you. Your probation just closed and you cannot be saved. And I just thought that voice was from the Lord. I thought the Lord was angry at me because of my being brought up by a ex-Catholic who was very much into the angry God life. You know, I remember once running across the field because I'd just been hit by lightning and I had survived it <clears throat> and running into the basement of the house. And now the house got hit by lightning and the fire is flying up and down the water pipes in the basement. And I remember just yelling, God, what did I do? I'm sorry for whatever it was you're angry at me about. I didn't know God loved me. I just thought God was out there trying to throw lightning at me. But <clears throat> So I began to have, you know, to deal with depression and things, and I struggled and struggled with this depression and thinking that God truly was angry at me and he was, he was hoping he could put me in the lake of fire. So I began to really look through the Bible and spirit of prophecy to see whether or not I was lost. And, you know, I, I guess I was, I'd read the promises and I, I read the gospel and I understood that it seemed like God was offering me an opportunity for salvation, but yet I thought there must be some fine print that was specific against me. And one day, um, my brother came by and he said, hey, I want you to go to a prison with me. We're going to give a Bible study. And when we got there, they told us we couldn't give a Bible study because we had to have a permit to be there first. And we hadn't applied for it. And we said, well, okay. And then the guy said, well, hang on a second. Well, next thing you know, we're in a in a room with the inmate and we're giving a bible study and the man walks in he sits down he he was so glad to see us he said man have i got questions for you number one who are the 24 elders and i remember my brother had this deer in the headlight buck even though he was an elder in the church and how is he going to try and explain that i mean i had just read through that in great detail earlier and god brought it all back to my mind very clear and as i explained it to him the man said that makes complete sense. Thank you. I am so excited that God sent you here. But when we left, it suddenly occurred to me that God had just used me. God had just brought things to my mind. The Holy Spirit was using me as an instrument. And I began to realize God wouldn't do that with someone that he hated and that he was trying to damn to the lake of fire. And I got really excited. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm actually able to be saved. God still loves me. And I was ecstatic. It was so exciting. Well, so that made Satan pretty angry. And so he began to try and to attack me with all kinds of things. He, he kept trying to drag me back into alcoholism. And he tried to get me back into the old music I had listened to. And um, I really struggled with it for a while. And then one day, um, I was lost in a, in a city. And I had to stop at a liquor store for directions because I had no idea where it was, how to get out of it. And the, um, the person at the liquor store counter gave me the directions to leave. And as I'm walking out, I saw all of these bottles. And it suddenly occurred to me that I had, I had no connection. I had no desire to, to buy or consume alcohol at all. And as I walked out, I'm like, how did that happen? And when did it happen? And how do you take someone who is psychologically and physically biologically addicted to the, to a substance and, and just have it just disappear without their knowledge this is impossible and you know i didn't go through any kind of withdrawal or what anything and i didn't even know what happened and i began to realize it's been about three three and a half months since i'd had a drink and i was so shocked and then i began reading it in the bible and i you know i read in uh, Psalms 5110, where David said, you know, create in me a clean heart. And I'd always been a little leery of that. I thought David just didn't want to take it, you know, 
take responsibility for his own actions and make clean up his life. Um, and uh, then I read Psalms 33, 6. This is by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And I realized that combined with John 1, 1 through 3, you know, the beginning, well, what was the word? And I began to realize that Jesus was the word and that his word had creative power. And as I'm reading my Bible, I'm reading creative power and I'm exposing my mind to creative power. And I realized that a little by little, God had recreated a new character and a new heart within me. And that the new character had no desire for alcohol. And it was so, I was so excited. I went home and, um, that night, my it was a Friday, and uh, so Friday night, and I'm I'm sitting there in the living room, just being quiet, and my wife said, "Hey, why don't you why don't you make me a drink?" And I'm like, uh, "Of what? You want some juice?" She said, "No, you know, make me a whiskey sour." And I said, "Well, it requires whiskey, and we don't have any." She said, "Are you kidding me that we don't have whiskey?" And I said, "No, we don't have any." She said, "Well, what did you do with it all?" And I said, "I poured it down the drain." She got pretty upset with me, and she said, "You." You wasted all that money. You pour all the whiskey down the drain. Oh, what for? And I said, because I don't want to consume it anymore. I don't want to drink anymore. And God delivered me from it. And she just looked at me like I was from another planet. And she said, well, get in the car and drive to the bar and get a bottle and come back and make me a drink. And I said, no, I will not. I don't want it in our house ever again. Big sigh. She looks at me and she said, well, we'll see how long this lasts. Well, it's one of the things that <laughs> I've been wrong a lot in my experience with her, but this is one I've been right in because it's been over 30 years, about 30 years that I've been drunk and I've had no desires to ever go back to it, um, none whatsoever. And I have to tell you that my favorite high is being sober. I love being in control. And I love, you know, the spirit is in control of my mind and thoughts and, and not some substance. So, you know, that was pretty amazing. Um, and I look back on that. It's a big encouragement to me a lot of times. Um, Satan also began to attack me physically like he did Job. And I was stricken with multiple sclerosis. And I nearly died from that. That was a really rough go. My wife used to grab me by my belt and my shirt collar, and that's how she would help me walk around from one chair to the next or get me out to the car or something like that. And if you can imagine a guy who's six foot two, weighing about 135 pounds with his eyes bulging out of his scrawny little skull, that was me. And I was dying, and I kept pleading with the Lord, Lord, please, please, don't let me die until my kids are out of high school because I don't want my wife to have to be a single parent struggling around raising these kids. Uh, she doesn't have a you know, big education and all that kind of thing. Um, and I began to really study and I began to look into, you know, old books, books on herbology and that sort of thing. And I already had quite a bit of science in my background uh, at that point. <clears throat> I had, you know, a pretty extensive background in sciences. So I began to really study because, you know, the, Mainstream medical people were telling me that it was a genetic disorder and that I, there was nothing I could do with it. Um, but somehow I just wasn't willing to accept that. And I began to study and it took me a number of years. And uh, in the process, I actually um, became a, a naturopathic physician. And I, I practiced that for quite a few years until I needed a change in life. But I, I actually was able to discover why. <laughs> And, uh, today you know i can look back and realize that i don't remember the last symptom i really don't remember the last time i had a symptom i, I have been extremely healthy ever since and at that point the lord said to me sorry brother you have you have been given your life back what will you do with it what will you give to the rest of my sheep? And I said, God, I'm going to start a health ministry and I'm going to go out and share the, the message. I am going to share the truth. And I am going to help other people get a little taste of what you have given me. 
you have given me my life. I want to help other people. And so I, I developed a ministry and began to share health messages with people all over the world. I trained so many medical missionaries, I have no idea how many. And then I became uh, really involved in not just caring for people, but for you know, answering questions and helping people find a new lifestyle and helping the people find a new direction. And so then one day I said, God, I feel like I'm in the Pentagon. I kind of want to go on the front lines. And uh, I want to, I want to become an evangelist. I want to actually go out and do evangelism, not just teach people. Uh, I want to, you know, share the gospel with people who don't know Jesus and don't know the truth. And right after that, I had the opportunity to go with a um, group of people to the Dominican Republic. And as I'm doing my very first evangelistic meeting, I began to realize that I'm using a canned set of sermons and they're not me. And I began to realize that I'm like David in Saul's armor. And I don't like this. I'm not comfortable with this. So I went home and I wrote my own. Um, and uh, of course, that's another long story too, because I realized that most of what we, were, what we were doing was we were going about it the wrong way. We were teaching people a bunch of doctrines and the last doctrine was baptism. We'd baptize them and you know, we went home and um, you lose all these people. I remember coming back to um, Peru two years after we had baptized around a thousand people and finding that only about 80 of those people were still in the churches. And it was pretty discouraging. And so I, I mentioned to one of the pastors in the Dominican Republic, I said, you know, I, I think we're going about this wrong, but I don't know what. And he said, well, we'll pray about it. We'll see what God says. Next morning, he said, God told me to tell you to preach like Dwight Moody. And I'm like, he, was a, he wasn't an evangelist. He was a revivalist. What's, what are you talking about? He said, that's your problem, but I, I just did what God said. So. I was kind of bummed about that, but I went home and I realized that we need to have Bible workers on the ground prior to us coming there and after we leave. And we need to make Christians out of these people before we make Seventh-day Adventists out of them. Because what happens if you tell somebody that now he got, you know, baptized in the holy water and now he's going to come up with a whole new life and a whole new person tomorrow morning, he shuts his finger in the car door and he says about seven four-letter words, and he realizes none of that happened and he gets discouraged and he leaves the faith. And so I said, we need to teach people how to be Christians. And so I changed my methods and I began to teach people um, that Jesus was coming and that when he came, you're going to be in a really big, big problem unless you had a new character and how you got that new character and what righteousness by faith was and how victory over sin could be obtained. And once we would do those things, I would leave. And then the, you know, the local people on the ground would tell me three and four months down the road, we now have these people ready for baptism. And I remember one man, one gentleman came to me on the street in the Dominican Republic one time. And he said, you don't remember me, but I was the really tall black guy in the very back of the room. And I came and I listened and I was so convicted and I knew that I should be baptized, but I knew I would lose my job because of the Sabbath. I didn't do it, but he said, I did it a month ago. So we're talking, it took 11 months for this gentleman. Had he been baptized right away, he would, have, he would not have stayed faithful. So, you know, that's, that's the story there. But the first time I was doing my meetings, all of my, all of my team got sick with what looked like an a influenza bug. And I didn't get sick until the very last week at the end of the week on Friday, I got sick. And I'm thinking, oh, this is terrible. High fever, how am I gonna finish this? Um, during the two weeks prior, I had a friend with me and we were walking down the streets and we kept finding people who were sick and had all kinds of dis you know, skin disorders and things. And so we would run to a pharmacy and get some, get some things to treat their conditions with and some bandages and some medications or whatever. And I began to realize, I think I just found my calling. I think I really found what God wants me to do. God wants me to be a medical missionary. God wants me to share things with these people. 
and I'm going to have to come back here and I'm going to have to start training medical missionaries here and make us less, you know, reliant on the pharmacy and more reliant on, on our lifestyle things if we, you know, when we can. And so I, uh, I remember the last night we had been taking care of patients all day in, in various places and little back rooms in the churches and on the street and street corners and people's homes. And this, uh, this evening now I'm sick. And I was pretty bummed that I, I had three people that I wasn't able to finish taking care of because we ran out of our supplies and I was, I was getting too sick to really almost stand up. Went back to my hotel room and I got a hold of a pastor and said, can you take my meeting tomorrow, tonight? He said, certainly I can. And I said, probably somebody to cover my meeting in the morning at, at the church because I think I'm going to be too sick because this fever is really high. So, you know, I'm sick all night. Next morning, they come and said, are you wanting to preach for church? And I said, no, I can't even get out of the bed. They said, okay, well, we'll come back and check on you at, at lunchtime and see if you're better by then. And I'm thinking, guys, it's taken everybody else three and four days to get well. I'm not going to get well, you know, instantly here. So they came back at noon. They said, okay, we have to take you to the pastor's house. And I said, why? I said, just, I don't want anything. I just want some water, maybe some fruit juice. Leave me alone. No, 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 brother, you have to come to the pastor's house because you remember those three patients that you told that you would take care of tomorrow? And I'm like, yeah. Okay, they're going to be there and they're going to be waiting for you. And so I got there and they're telling me that I have to take care of these three patients. Well, I look and I see 30 patients. And I'm like, wait, I said three. And they said, well, they must have invited others. And I'm like, what? what am I going to do? Because I'm too sick to even hardly almost stand up. And they said, oh, and I looked up and now a truck rolls up, a flatbed truck with people sitting on it, about another 30 jump off. And then I see there a little van shows up and there's people in it. And all total, there was almost, there was like about 69 people showing up for me to take care of them. And I'm the sick one, sicker than anyone. And they kept telling me, here, you have to eat something. So I ate two little tiny squares of watermelon, drank some water. And I'm, the whole time I'm praying, Lord, I got myself into something that I have no idea how to get out of. But I can't take care of these in this condition. I have to feel better to do this. And can you, like, send, a, send another doctor? Can you do something to help these people? What can, you know, Lord, help me. And the guys came up and they said, okay. We've set up a little clinic in the pastor's bedroom and the living room will be the waiting room and we need you to get started. And I have a fever of about 103. I'm dizzy, my head aches, my stomach doesn't feel very well. I ache all over, I'm shivering, I can't do it. And I said, Lord, I need help. And I got this impression I should just put my feet in the water. So I stood up and started walking to the room and instantly I had 100% of my, of my strength. I had no fever. I had no aching, no chills, no dizziness. I felt 100%. And I took care of those people. Uh, just in time, we finished up with the last of those people, just in time to be able to go to the last meeting. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, when I went home, I said, God, I found my niche. I found what you want me to do. You are still the same God that was there for Elijah and Elisha and Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Peter and Paul. You're the same God. And I've found my, I've found my calling. And since that time, that's 2001. And since that time, through medical missionary evangelism um, and through the being able to train and involve other people, uh, our little ministry has brought about 2,000 people to the Seventh-day Adventist faith. And it's been such a blessing to be able to know that God can take one person who was his enemy and put him out forth as a champion in his cause. It's very humbling uh, to think of where I've come from to where God has taken me. And I understand that it's only by the power of his grace, only through Jesus and through the spirit that anything has ever taken place that's been good in my life 
there's nothing good in me. And if I were to fall by the wayside today, I don't have any brownie points with Jesus. I need to stay faithful. There's nothing good in me. I have no, no way to come to God and say, hey, look what I did for you. Because I didn't do it for him. He did it through me. And, you know, I just want to encourage each and every one of you, uh, as you're looking forward to what, what, do you, what is God calling you to do? Um, and, of course, this ministry that we're participating in at this moment is focused on helping people see the value and the benefit of moving out of the cities into the countryside. And I will just tell you that I've lived both in the city and in the country. And you can get distracted in both places. You can get too busy in both places. And busy is an acronym, which basically comes from the first letters of a number of words. And it's called bondage under Satan's yoke. And you can get too busy. Um, you know, when you're, you're hoping to you know, run a little business and have some work to be able to create an income for yourself, you hope you can get busy. But Lord, don't let us get too busy. Um, but I will tell you, in the country where I am right now, deep in the forest, I can walk outside, I can breathe fresh air, I can look at the plants, I can smell the flowers, I can breathe in all those negative ions that are so invigorating to my immune, to my immune system, and I can hear the spirit talk to me. And I don't have to look at the billboards. I don't have to look at the flashing lights. I don't have to deal with the movies and the, the restaurants and the fast pace of life and all the temptation. Um, I remember when we did live in Orlando and I remember my father-in-law coming to me and he said, you know, I think you guys, you kids really should consider moving to the country. <clears throat> I said, why is that? We just we got decent jobs here and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, I think it'd be a better environment for the kids. And I'm like, why? He said, well, your four-year-old just called me a four-letter word. And I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, Lord, if you can get me out of this city and back into the country, I'm ready to go tomorrow. And uh, yeah, it was about two weeks. I got a phone call from, from a company from my little hometown offering me a job, which would enable me to move back out to the, to the country again. And I've never lived in the city since, and I am so grateful for that. Friends, you just, you cannot understand how wonderful it is to move um, like Brother Enoch did into the country. Go to the city to meet with people and to share your faith with them and to be able to get in your car and drive 20 miles out into the woods. It's a good thing. and. Uh, I'm very grateful for it. So I guess I am done, Sharon. We can do a question and answer, or if you've got something else ready. Thank you so much, Brother Rob. Yes, so um, that was a very inspiring story. I didn't even know that. Uh, but praise God, we do serve an awesome, awesome God. Mm -hmm.